Morning, Gloria America. Bonjour, hi, Canada. I'm Hugh Hewitt inside the Beltway. A good Tuesday to you. It is Election Day in New York. I'm looking at the cover of the New York Post this morning. Vote to save New York. Eric Adams is the choice of the New York Post. The Brooklyn Borough president, African-American former cop, has surged to a significant lead over Andrew Young, according to a new poll. He is uh, the first choice of 28 percent of Democratic voters, followed by Andrew Yang at 20 percent. Former Sanitation Commissioner, 15 percent. City Hall lawyer Maya Wiley in fourth with 13 percent. The poll of 2,924 New York City residents conducted June 10 through June 17 also shows Adams beating Yang 56 to 44 percent in the seventh round of ranked choice voting simulation. Now, ranked choice voting is a nightmare, so I don't know when we'll find out the end of this, but you go through and you drop in the first round everybody who, the lowest person who did not get enough votes to compete. So then they're down to six and they take the seventh person's vote and they redistribute them and then the fifth person's vote and redistribute them. To me, it's a question about whether or not the nutters in the city have distributed themselves, the, the Bill de Blasio fans, to get like 8% in the polls. Where do those people go? Uh, the socialists, and consequences be doggone to the world. We're not going to care what the consequences are. But normal, middle of the road, middle class New Yorkers would like not to be shot on their way to work, don't want their cars vandalized, don't want gangsters running around the street shooting kids, don't want random acts of violence occurring. They're voting for Eric Adams and a return to basically Giuliani Bloomberg style seriousness about policing. The first rule of a city is to police. The second is to keep the streets clean, the garbage picked up. And Bill de Blasio's nightmare eight years is almost over. Who are the billionaires' picks? According to the New York Times, follow the money. Steve Cohen donated a half million dollars to Mr. Pack's, uh, Mr. Yang's pack, and a half million dollars to Mr. Adams' pack. A similar trajectory characterized the giving patterns of Daniel Loeb, another hedge fund billionaire. He donated a half million dollars to Mr. Adams' super PAC and a half million dollars to Mr. Yang's super PAC. And then Mr. Loeb gave Mrs. Mr. Adams' super PAC another half million dollars. You see, Yang and Adams are perceived as being the least crazy people. And so New York City will tell us a lot about the Democrats, and they know they've gone nuts on critical race theory, on um, rejecting voter ID. In fact, there's a story in the Washington Post by Aaron Blake yesterday, Stacey Abrams and the Democrats' evolution on voter ID. Because the voting reform bill will come up today, and it's not voting reform, it's state suppression bill. It's an anti-voter integrity bill. And Joe Manchin's compromise actually has voting ID in it, but it also still takes away from the states the ability to run their own election, so it will fail too. But Stacey Abrams and the Democrats have finally figured out that the country wants voting ID. It really does. Like super majorities, over 70 percent, want people to show an ID at the polls before they vote or to get an absentee ballot. They want to make sure that people are people. Easy to vote, hard to cheat. That's won the debate. And so... Today, I, I love the coverage in the Washington Post. Activists gear up for battle as Senate Republicans prepare to vote in, to block voting rights bill. That's like my gearing up to take on LeBron James in a one-on-one -on -one game. All right, so yeah, I would gear up, and I would get crushed. Me, I, I'd gear up to take on uh, Bryson DeChambeau, right? And he could have the worst day ever and throw a tantrum, and I'd still be gearing up for no. You can gear up all you want. There is no battle. There is no Senate voting bill coming out. It's not happening because there are not even close to 60 votes for it. Not remark And so Democrats unite behind voting rights bill as it faces a Senate roadblock. Actually, they haven't united. They have to go for, if anything, Manchin's compromise. And Manchin's compromise is still not even close to being constitutional. So it's going to fail. Stocks rebounded yesterday. The Dow gained 500 points. Amazon even fell a little bit, 1%, and it was prime day one. Today is prime day two. Why did that happen? They think that inflation will be dealt with by the Fed with two quarter point increases next year, and the price of lumber went down. 
And so all of a sudden, investors says, let the party begin. We're still getting $2 billion and probably another $2 trillion. We're probably getting another trillion. So let the investing begin. And inflation is going to be here at 4 and 5%. So we're not going to buy treasuries at 1.5% for 10 years. So they're off to the markets. And I expect there will be continued revelry in the markets. We will see. Interesting story in the New York Times. How do they say economic recovery? Quote, I quit. It's happening all over the country. People are quitting their jobs. Why? Because it's a dynamic job market. People need workers everywhere. Dwayne, are you there today? Is Dwayne there? Okay, yeah. okay good. Just want to make sure you didn't quit. Um, not, the, yet. Uh, not, not yet. So still, it's, still day. it's still early. It's still early. Of course it is. That we got three hours to go. But nevertheless, when you read a headline like that, I'm sure Heckle and Jekyll are there, aren't they? Ben and Harley? They are here. For now. Uh, for now. Okay. It, it would be bad if during the show they were reading this New York Times story and they wandered off down the hallway and said, I'm going to go work for Supercycle or whatever it is. Uh, lumber prices fell, Dwayne. I want you to know that as well. Now, you have finished, Just right? in the nick of just time. Just in the, uh, you're all done, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I just wanted people to know Dwayne Timing. was action. <laughs> Dwayne is has everything. actually done everything. Dwayne has done everything. He's done, and so the uh, demand for lumber has plummeted because he built the palace. You think Gallagher is done with his remodel? Is that the other thing that's going on? Maybe Mike is done? Uh, on, on which on which palace? Well, he's got four of them. I know. That's what I'm saying. Which, which one are you he's talking about? I thought about? he was only working on two of them. I thought he was working on the Colorado Retreat <laughs> and the New Orleans <laughs> penthouse. Am I right? Uh, okay, so that, something like that, yes. Yeah, uh, so the lumber is falling down. Now the bad news is eating disorders surged among adolescents during the pandemic. And when we count the cost of the CDC's many failures, that's going to be number one. Uh, this impact on young people at a fragile age. They've done a lot of terrible damage to themselves. Yesterday, and I'm going to spend most of the first hour talking about this. I'm going to talk about it with a lot of our guests today. Student athletes win U.S. Supreme Court showdown against the NC2A. Supreme Court backs payments to student athletes in NCAA case. Supreme Court rejects NCAA's tight limits on athlete benefits compensation. Supreme Court rules against the NCAA restrictions on colleges offering educational perks to compensate student athletes. Okay, the reality is it was a unanimous court upholding an injunction that was rather limited, but in it took Justice Kavanaugh two pages to say what Justice Gorsuch said in 35, and I'll go over that. Justice Gorsuch had the majority opinion, so we don't know if everyone agrees with Kavanaugh, but Kavanaugh is blistering. Gorsuch is careful and gives us a history of the Sherman Antitrust Act, which no, but everyone just wants it. They, they want to know, what can we give to the kids to get them to come to school? There's a competitive market out there for athletes. What can we give to the kids? And so the most important person in America right now is named District Judge Claudia Wilkin out in Oakland, because she issued the original injunction, which was upheld by the Ninth Circuit and which was upheld by a unanimous Supreme Court, which, by the way, is a heck of a way to go, Judge Wilkin. And people ought to be out there doing the <laughs> golf clap for Judge Wilkin, because you rarely get your injunction when they're very detailed and long to survive a Ninth Circuit review and then to be unanimously. She did a good job, and it's back to her now to explain what the NCA two, the NC2A can do and not do. I hope she guts them. I hate the organization. I hate the game, not the players. So the people at the NCA might be very nice, but the NCA should be put in the grave. Uh, meanwhile, the U.S. swim team is taking 11 teenagers to Tokyo Olympics. What could go wrong? In Washington, the Israeli Defense Force chief warned against rejoining the Iran deal. Tom Cotton will be along. Raiza, the new crazy right-wing nutter mullah running Iran's, you know, uh, Pretend presidency says ballistic missiles are not negotiable. And the EU has said the crown and pole dark may not be shown in Europe. That makes a lot of sense. Don't go anywhere, America. I'm going to tell you a lot about student athletes when the show returns on The Hugh Hewitt Show. Streaming on Salem Now. As Galileans, we witnessed his first miracle. This is the most profound discovery in human history. This discovery proves that he is coming back. Obama taught his country.
country down. No one stood up to him. Nobody. My parents didn't teach me that I was a victim. And Uncle Tom is somebody who has sold out. I will not pretend to be a victim in this country. I know that that makes many people on the left uncomfortable. Most black people don't believe that other blacks can be independent free thinkers. When there's chaos, when there's pandemics, when there's riots, people think, where is God? God always manages to reemerge. This Constitution is intended for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for the government of any other. Stream on your phone, tablet, or TV. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. Trending Now on America First with Sebastian Verka. And how is the man responding to her who bears the title of President of the United States? What the hell do you do over there? First response, if you couldn't hear it. I know it's, you know, it's live TV coverage. It was recorded from a distant mic. And then he said, what? You shouldn't be in this business? Biden, you shouldn't be in the White House. And then second of all, what did he say about geopolitics in Russia? I have no confidence in anything. Neither do we, as long as you're the president. So don't lecture us by telling us what you think Putin does or doesn't want. Because this clip, clip four is patently untrue. Play cuts. I, uh, I think that the last thing he wants now is a Cold War. Based on the fact, I mean, let's just add some historic context. For the whole of the Cold War, was there ever a moment from the Berlin blockade of 1948 until the collapse of the Berlin Wall on November 9th, 1989. Was there one moment in that ideological standoff where 43% of the Eastern Seaboard's gas supply was shut down by Russians? Just once. I'm not talking about OPEC and Carter and price rising and gouging and a cartel activity out of the Middle East. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe today at rumble.com. Trending now on The Charlie Kirk Show. United States Congress has finally found something they can agree on. United States Congress, of course, can't agree on whether or not the Constitution is a document worthy of honoring. They can't agree on whether or not they should curb inflation. They can't address the crisis on the southern border. They can't try to bring back manufacturing jobs to our country. But the one thing that Congress has decided to agree on, and every single senator voted in favor of this, was to create a new federal holiday. 14 members of the House of Representatives deserve credit for voting against this. And that is to create a new federal holiday called Juneteenth. Now, you might not have heard this before. Juneteenth. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at rumble.com. Trending now on The Larry Elder Show. News is the mayor of Chicago is doing something about all of this. She's declaring racism a public health crisis. I kid you not. This is a black mayor in a city with a black police chief with a black public superintendent of school complaining about systemic racism when blacks are running the system I, I... Twenty two minutes after the hour, America. If you've watched Apple TV's nineteen seventy one, you know that Shaft was a big deal. As was the music in Shaft. Anyway, welcome back. Time for the business stories of the day brought to you by Birch Gold. 
Birch Gold is your source for buying gold. Simply go to hughgold.com. Text my name, Hugh, to 474747. They'll either sell you gold direct or they will send you an information kit on rolling over a portion of your IRA, your 401k, into physical uh, precious metals. Gold, silver, some of you like platinum. I never understood that. But gold's the one I, I think is smart. It's the one I own in the safety deposit box. And I think everyone should have 5 to 10% of their portfolio in precious metals. Birch Gold will help you do that. I trust them. That's who I buy my gold from. I recommend them to you. HughGold.com or text my name, Hugh, to 474747. There are actually three stories here. First, the Bitcoin price extended its cataclysmic drop after China intensified a crypto crackdown. Authorities ordered Ant Group and state banks to root out cryptocurrency-related activities. See, cryptocurrency activities evade government review. And in this case, the Chinese Communist Party is doing what every financial authority is going to do in every country eventually. And the IRS is going to do it too. They're going to want to look at both ends of a cryptocurrency exchange to see if someone made a capital gain or profit. Because that's a taxable event. I'm not going to bore you to tears with a taxable event, but let's say you buy a car for ten thousand and you sell it for fifteen thousand on the same day, and if you use cash, you have to pay money on the money you just made—a capital investment or stock. It's easier to do if you buy Apple today for a hundred dollars and it goes up two hundred dollars. You owe capital gains tax on the two hundred dollars, or if you get a check for five thousand dollars in the mail. Uh, somebody, that check is something. It's either a gift, a windfall, a lottery winning. Most likely somebody paid you for something. If you're paid in Bitcoin, they want to know in the federal government and the Chinese Communist Party if you owe them some tax. It's a taxable event to be paid money in the United States. You might not make enough money to be taxed, but you probably do. If you're listening to this show, this is the Taxpayer Show. Generally, we talk to young people who intend to make money, middle-aged people who are making money, and senior citizens who are trying to save their money. Uh, but Bitcoin price dropped. It's going to keep going down. Number two, in the FANG stock world, Netflix strikes a deal with filmmaker Steven Spielberg. Now, you say to yourself, I know you're saying to yourself, how old is Steven Spielberg? Steven Spielberg is 74 years old. So he's got a lot of movies left in him, and he's going to make content for Netflix. They're paying him a lot of money. That's a significant edge because Amazon Prime, Apple TV, Netflix, Apple TV's 1971 show is an excellent show. It costs money to do excellent shows. I had Jonathan Swan on yesterday. Lots of you watched my podcast with him at the interview with Hugh Hewitt. Jonathan works for HBO and Axios. There are going to be a lot of shows like that, a lot of Bill Mars, a lot of uh, Axios, no doubt a punch bowl coming up. All of these Streaming services have to produce programming, original programming to attract people to watch and keep their subscription going. Because eventually they're going to get their cable bill or their streaming bill and say, wow, I have too many streaming services and what are they going to go to? There's going to be one rule to ring them, one ring to rule them all. And so Spielberg signing with Netflix is good for Netflix. Amazon bought a MGM last week. That was good for MGM. Disney is Disney. I think those are the three that last, but we will see. Apple, Hulu, not too sure. Um, those are, those are very different situations. And then finally, the big story, which I'm going to come back to after the break, athletes in the NC2A. I think the, the rush is on. The rush is on. There's going to be a, a giant convening of the conferences because they can't work with each other. If you read, I'm going to read you Brett Kavanaugh's concurrence after the break. And my phone number is 1-800-520-1234, should the NC2A be destroyed. 1-800-520-1234, should the NC2A be destroyed. Judge Wilkin out in Oakland, she is now the lord of the NC2A. She got her injunction approved. Should they be destroyed? I say yes, because they've grown up in the, in the cracks of the so-called amateur system exploiting young people. It's time to end that. We'll talk about that after the break, right here on The Hugh Hewitt Show.
Trending now on the Mike Gallagher Show. It feels like every day this week I've come into the studio with some bleak news. Did you see President Biden completely shut down while being asked a question by a member of the media this week about Vladimir Putin? And then his answer was completely incoherent. This is the 46th president of the United States. This is the man who's representing the country to the world. You have to hear this, cut one. Here was President Biden being asked by a reporter, what do you say about Vlad- Vladimir Putin? What, what, what's, what, and li- you gotta hear this, this is unbelievable. What do you say to Vladimir Putin? <laughs> To answer the first question, <laughs> I'm laughing too. They actually, I. Well, look, I mean, he has made clear that uh, uh, we're not editing anything here. It's actual pause. The answer is, I believe he has in the past essentially acknowledged that he was. Uh, there are certain things that he would do or did do. But look, um, when I was asked that question on air, I answered it honestly. But it's not much of a, I, 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 I don't think it matters a whole lot in terms of this next meeting we're about to have. The second question was, rela- does use the Be- I'd verify first and then trust. Oh, my Lord. I I mean, honest to good. We didn't edit anything. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at Rumble.com. Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. Virtually every woman that I meet, every young woman that I meet, when when I say, so are you hoping to get married? It's sort of, the answer is sort of, yeah, no, no, you know, if, you know, if the right man comes along. And by the way, men say very similar things. But the, the, the crisis is because women are not wanting to get married as much. It's a crisis about men. I've talked about men, the issue of men, masculinity and the like very often. But I'm talking about women today what the message you would give to a young woman, what you give to your daughter. There's another question related to this. If, if a talented and bright young woman said to her parents, you know, I eventually would like something in, in, in the work arena, but I first and foremost want to make a family, find a good man and make a family, would you be happy? Or would you think that she had uh, listened to the Dennis Prager show too often? That's that's a legit question. And would she be happier? So let's say she marries at 25, actually finds a good guy, which is easier at 25 than 35. As I've often put it, good men do not grow on trees. In fact, it's harder and harder to find them because... We have given them no masculine roles in life. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Eric Metaxas Show. What brought you to this place? What is what is your story? Because there are so few pastors in America. I'm meeting more and more that are that yeah. are like you, and I praise God. But but what led you uh, to be the man of God you are today? You know, I traveled for almost 11 years as an evangelist, 48 states, 15 countries, and so I just began to see the demise. I began to see the the crumbling of our nation. And so then, 15 years ago, in 2006, I came off the road full time, started the church. It was way before 
any type of social media presence, you know, the thing just blew up. And so I just began to see that pastors just aren't standing. They just kind of have this willy-nilly idea, just kind of approach the pulpit, dearly beloved, welcome to be here. And people were bored. What I'm finding is men that hate church love our church. And wives are super excited because we have hundreds and hundreds of men that are coming to our church like, we want a man to be our pastor. We want this guy to stand up and say what needs to be said. And so I think the lack of having a backbone drove me to want to have a ministry that stiffens people's backbones. Does that make sense? When men are men, women love it. They think, where have you been? Yeah. And men love to see that. And that's why churches have been feminized. Look, this goes way back into yeah. the 19th century. Mark Twain made fun of it, that, you know, <laughs> all the old women love church, the church biddies. But when you see a church full of men who love God, it, it has a whole different yes. character. And that makes the spirit of this age very uncomfortable. It's at war. Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. I, um, I really loathe the NCAA because they're a bunch of petty bureaucrats throwing around power that they were never intended to have. For example, dictating which states may or may not have conference finals. They were originally intended to maintain amateurism, but amateurism did not at that time generate multi-hundred million dollars of revenue for universities, which are uh, exploiting the superstars in the games that matter, which are primarily men's football and men's basketball. All the games matter, but the ones that make money are men's football and men's basketball. That's just the way it is. So the NC2A has grown and grown and grown. Uh, just a big parasite on the hours of sweat put into the gym and onto the track and onto the fields of play by young men and women across the United States. And the parasite got so big it finally burst yesterday. And at first, because it tried to regulate the amount of educational benefits that schools could give to student athletes. And by that, it means, could they send them abroad for a semester? Could they give them a computer? Could they give them tutoring? Could they give them a graduate education as part of their scholarships? It should have gone even further, but the court limited its relief to that area and upheld other NC2A rules and the plaintiffs did not sue. The plaintiffs wanted to get to the court and get the ruling they got, which was a big slap down of the NC2A, just a huge slap down. Now, Justice Gorsuch wrote 35 pages of the history of everything about antitrust, and it's a fine and elegant opinion for antitrust classes. You want to know what can they do? Uh, the relief focuses, writes Justice Gorsuch, on allowing schools to offer scholarships for graduate degrees or vocational school and to pay for things like computers and tutoring. The NCAA fears schools might exploit this authority to give student athletes luxury cars to get them to class and other unnecessary or inordinately valuable items only nominally related to education. Again, however, this overreads the injunction Gorsuch pointing back to the original Judge Wilkin injunction. Under the current decree, the NCAA is free to forbid in-kind benefits unrelated to a student's actual education. Nothing stops it from enforcing a no Lamborghini rule. Uh, the district court invited the NCAA to specify and later enforce rules delineating which it benefits it considers legitimately related to education. To the extent the NCA believes meaningful ambiguity really exists about the scope of its authority regarding internships, academic awards, in-kind benefits, it's been free to seek clarification from the district court since the court issued its injunction three years ago. The NCAA remains free to do so today. Today, the NCAA has sought clarification only once, the precise amount at which it can cap academic awards. The NCAA just wants to keep its boot on athletes. And it's got to end. And so I hope now that some conferences decide they can do things like we're going to give scholarships not only to the athletes, but to the athlete's siblings. That seems to me to be an educated related benefit. You know why? 
Talk to me about the reality of having three kids in college versus one kid in college in a house. Do you think that overall enhances the academic performance of the athlete to have brothers and sisters in college at the same time, maybe at the same school? Yes, it will. Talk to me about summer jobs. Everybody I know had a summer job who went to college. Those who were athletes had summer jobs. There were elaborate ruses to get people jobs from alumni. They had to do the work, but they weren't illegal. I know you're out there. By the way, I want to know if you agree with me. 1-800-520-1234. Take off the phones, Ben. You can burn the NC2A to the ground. The key is Justice Kavanaugh's concurring opinion. He writes, and he just blisters the NCAA. The NCAA has long restricted the compensation and benefits that student athletes may receive. And with surprising success, the NCAA has long shielded its compensation rules from ordinary antitrust activity. Today, however, the court holds that the NCAA has violated the antitrust laws. The court's decision marks an important and overdue course correction, and I join the court's excellent opinion in full. But this case involves only a narrow subset of the NCAA's compensation rules, namely the rules restricting the education-related benefits that student-athletes may receive, such as post-eligibility scholarships at graduate or vocational schools. The rest of the NCAA's compensation rules are not at issue here and therefore remain on the books. Those remaining compensation rules generally restrict student-athletes from receiving compensation or benefit from their colleges for playing sports, and those rules have also historically restricted student-athletes from receiving money from endorsement deals and the like. I add this concurring opinion, writes Justice Kavanaugh, to underscore that the NCAA's remaining compensation rules also raise serious questions under the antitrust laws. Three points warrant emphasis. First, the court does not address the legality of the NCAA's remaining compensation rules. As the court says, student athletes did not renew their across the board challenge to the NCAA compensation restrictions. Accordingly, we do not pass judgment on them. Second, I mean, and Kavanaugh is saying, bring it on, friends, bring it on. We'll, we'll hear that case. Second, although the, Kavanaugh does not, although the court does not weigh in on the ultimate legality of the NCAA's remaining compensation rule, the, the court's decision establishes how any such rule should be analyzed going forward. It does, and that's bad news for the NCAA. Third, there are serious questions whether the NCAA's remaining compensation rules can pass muster under ordinary rule of reason scrutiny. That's an antitrust term. Under the rule of reason, the NCAA must supply a legally valid pro-competitive justification for its remaining compensation rules. As I see it, however, the NCAA may lack such a justification. He's not ruling. This is all dicta, but it's all saying NCAA, the march of the death of your organization has begun. Joe in Sarasota, Florida. Hi, Joe. Good morning, Joe. I can tell you every morning going to work. Uh, by the way, I'm a Rose Tide fan, but I've got a lot of respect for Ohio State. My boss is Ohio State. Well, well, Joe. One, I thank you for listening. Two, we're just we're going to educate you on the fact that the sun is setting in Alabama and it's rising over Lake Erie. That's all I want you to know. <laughs> I hear you. Hugh. Hey, listen. I think that uh, Judge Kavanaugh, uh, what he came out with is is something that we've been waiting for years to happen. Uh, I believe the NCAA has been really, really tight, really too tight on athletes coming into the programs. And I thought what they did yesterday was great. And I think it's going to lead to a lot of good things around the country here soon. I worry about the small schools. Will they have an opportunity with the decision? And I'll leave with that. Thank you, Hugh. You know, I want to talk about that because thank you. Thank you, Joe, very much. 1-800-520-1234. The bottom line, writes Kavanaugh, is that the NCAA and its member colleges are suppressing the pay of student athletes who collectively generate billions of dollars in revenues for colleges every year. Those enormous sums of money flow to seemingly everyone except the student athlete. College presidents, athletic directors, coaches, conference commissioners, NCAA executives take in six and seven figure salaries. Colleges build lavish new facilities. But the student athletes who generate the revenues, many of whom are African American and from lower income backgrounds, end up with little or nothing. Everyone agrees the NCAA can require student athletes to be enrolled at students in good standing. But the NCAA's business model 
of using unpaid student athletes to generate billions of dollars in revenue for colleges raises serious questions under the antitrust laws. In particular, it is highly questionable whether the NCA and its member colleges can justify not paying student athletes a fair share of the revenues on the circular theory that the defining characteristic of college sports is that colleges do not pay student athletes. And if, the, and if that asserted justification is unavailing, it is not clear how the NCA can legally defend its remaining compensation rules. Bottom line, it can't. It can't do it. Now, the small schools aren't going to pay their athletes. They're going to get athletes who aren't going to go professional ever and who can't fill up stadiums but who want to play. And the alumni from, you know, the old blue and gray, you know, whatever it is that you rooted for. Maybe you're a Crimson Tide fan, and that would be sad. That would mean you're not an Auburn fan. Actually, it would be really sad if you weren't an Ohio State fan. I mean... Northwestern is never going to compete, but Northwestern makes a lot of money from being in the Big Ten. And I know the Wildcat fans are going to yell at me. But they nevertheless should pay their athletes because they're in a conference that's making a bunch of dough. So if they want someone to come to Northwestern, they ought to be able to compete on price. Not just, we'll give you a scholarship, and our degree is better than their degree. That's, that's what happens right now. Michigan and Northwestern used to say, well, you know, our schools actually... Are, you're employable when you graduate from our schools. That's not true because it depends on what you take and whether you go to class, whether you're employable. So some of these student athletes need to make some money at the beginning to capitalize. And the opportunity cost of not paying them anything is enormous over the life of their uh, uh, athletic career. But more importantly, the capital that they could accumulate in the four years. Playing sports in order to launch a small business or whatever is enormous. But I go back just the, the court said you can't restrict educational benefits unreasonably yesterday and, and restrain trade. Right now, if I'm mom or dad or grandma or grandpa or the advisor, first of all, agents are going to have a whole lot more work. If you're an athlete about to go to school, you sit down and talk to your college counselor about admitting your sister and your brother. And they're going to say, we can't do that. And you're going to say, why don't you go back to Judge Wilkin and ask? That's the answer. Well, if you really want me, if I'm a five-star recruit playing Division I football, I'd like my brother to get a four-year scholarship is a question you should be asking. They used to be able to say, oh, the NC2A won't let us do that. Now they've got to say, well, you know, let us check. And they're going to say, well, we don't have an answer at the conference. Well, go ask Judge Wilkin. The NCAA can ask, Dudge, the NCAA can ask Judge Wilkin anything. So they ought to ask about sibling scholarships, number one. And I think sibling scholarships are the way to improve a vast amount of America educational opportunity who have gotten crappy public school educations in lockdown, union-driven schools. I was talking to my friend Norton Rainey, who runs A Scholarships. Norton and I do not believe there's systemic racism in the United States. We believe there are horrible public schools, though. And A Scholarships gets out there and raises money to get Kids who are trapped, kids of all backgrounds, all races, all religions, get them out of horribly failing public schools, get them into high, high functioning quality private schools. That's what ACE does, very simple business model. And we don't think systemic racism is behind crappy public schools. We think terrible administration, too many non-teachers, too many rules, school unions, that's buying crappy education. So if you want to save a family, if one of them is a great athlete, let them give scholarships as well to the rest of the family. Let them give vocational education to mom and dad. That's the way to open it up. Go back and ask Judge Wilkin. All you kids out there, you're, you don't need an agent. You just need to tell your school counselor, go ask Judge Wilkin, because the court said she can answer. And I don't think you can get relief factor thrown in, although that is highly educational to be in good shape every day. Relief Factor has I like Karen Kirkham and Rosvera Chon Omega. You want an education benefit? Look up those four and the wonders they do for your body. ReliefFactor.com. I shake it every day. Today I'm taking it with bubbly, sparkling water, cherry bubbly. I have run out of coffee. There is no coffee in the house, which makes the morning a little bit different than normal since I drink about a half a pot of coffee in the morning. But... I'm here for you anyway, and I'm here to tell you that ReliefFactor.com matters a great deal. 
you should be out there and walking after the show or, or when you get to work, take the steps. Or if you got a long commute and your back hurts, you didn't take your relief factor, you should have. Take it every day just like to do. I do. I'm coming back with David Drucker. Don't go anywhere, America. It's the Hugh Hewitt Show. This is Hugh Hewitt for townhall.com. Sometime next year, the Supreme Court will decide whether to continue to find the right to abortion in the Constitution or give up on its deeply misguided half-century-long effort to do so. The court will have before it the case of Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization and the constitutionality of a 2018 Mississippi law that banned abortions after the first 15 weeks of pregnancy. The court will also be deciding on whether or not to uphold a poor decision made at the intellectual low ebb of its post-war era. The court made law at Roe v. Wade. And Justice Blackmun's opinion was simply awful in its reasoning. In fact, I would argue the 1973 was the point of origin of the culture wars. Because in Roe, the court seized territory reserved for the state legislatures. Will the court let us have peace at the cost of admitting that its ambition to rule was the real spark for the fire's long burning? Wisdom and the express language of the Constitution counsels it to quit the field. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Verka. For the whole of the Cold War, was there ever a moment from the Berlin blockade of 1948 until the collapse of the Berlin Wall on November 9th, 1989? Was there one moment in that ideological standoff where 43% of the eastern seaboard's gas supply was shut down by Russians? Just once! I'm not talking about OPEC and Carter and price rising and gouging and a cartel activity out of the Middle East. I'm talking about actions by the Soviet Union that led to empty gas stations and gas lines. Was there? Not once. And that was the real Cold War. But now, you, Joe Biden, you think, oh, no, that lovely, lovely KGB colonel, he doesn't want a new Cold War. Then what happened a month ago, here in the nation's capital, when more than 80%, 80% of the gas stations had no gasoline? How's that for a real Cold War? How's the fact that there is a large part of the sovereign nation of Ukraine called the Crimea, which belongs, belongs now through force, through the use of military might to the Russian Federation, not because of some plebiscite, not because of some civil war, because Russia took it by force. How is it that there are still Russian troops across Syria meddling? Oh, yes, they're just contractors. They're private citizens. They're, oh, I don't know, on holiday. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe today at rumble.com. Trending now on The Charlie Kirk Show. Let's, pl let's test Charlie right here. I am guessing Clarence Thomas and Alito were the two. No, Clarence Thomas and Gorsuch. It had to be Clarence Thomas. No. What a surprise. How about Amy Coney Barrett and, no, Kavanaugh? Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt, joined by David Drucker, the Washington Examiner. You see him on TV as well. Good morning, Drucker. How are you? I'm great, Hugh. How are you? Good. I learned yesterday from Punch Bowl or Axios that you're one of 17 people coming out with a book about President Trump. What's the title of yours and when does it drop? I didn't even realize that this was out. Yeah. Um, still working out the title. It's coming out this fall and it's I'm trying to look ahead and look forward. And so this isn't a retrospective, although there's context in there, but it's about how I'm hoping that I'm telling the story of how the former president has impacted the party going forward. And, okay, um, I'm, I'm good with titles. I, I helped Sarah Huckabee Sanders with her 
So I'm going to suggest you to use AT slash BT or BT slash AT before Trump, after Trump. That's, so that, that's just my for the moment, but it's coming out in the fall. Correct. Okay, when do I get the galleys? Uh, next, next month. All right, good. Just checking. All right, good. You know, you're 17 books, man. You cannot. You shouldn't be talking to me. You should be writing or editing. You're probably in the copy editing part right now, aren't you? Yeah, how do you know I'm not writing or editing? Exactly. You could be. You could be. All right. I want to talk to you about Kristen Sinema's op-ed in the Washington Post this morning. She says, look, we used the filibuster last year. to. And this is great. A Democratic senator saying, hey, we used the filibuster last year on a couple of big issues, and you're crazy not to think you'll be back in the minority, in the, in the minority so I support 60 votes. Will that finally end the silly, because the voting rights bill isn't going to pass today, that nothing's going to pass that then get 60 votes, and the 60-vote threshold isn't going away. It's been silly to talk about it. It is silly to talk about it, but no, it's not going to end the discussion, because in part, the Democratic base believes that, um, and, I, and I really think think the base believes this, the Democratic base, that Republicans don't really want to govern. And so if you give up on the filibuster, even when we end back end up back in the minority, Republicans won't actually do anything with a 51 vote uh, legislative advantage. And therefore, there really is no danger. And I think that is, a, a, you know, both sides tend to get the other side wrong on, on particular things. But a lot of very progressive Democrats don't think Republicans want to govern. And so they don't really think there is much downside to ending up back in the minority because Republicans won't do anything anyway. What do you and mean by want to govern? What, is, what, what do they think that means, David? Does that mean pass laws? Do they think that's yeah. governing? But do well, they think that well, hiring well, police well, is governing? Because that's what Republicans want to do. They want to hire more police because we've got a crime panic in the United well, look, States that, going on. Look, that, that will all be debated. But my point is, if you were to tell the progressive base, look, re Republicans would pass this law and that law and this law and that law, they'd say, no, I mean, maybe, but maybe not, and probably not, because they don't really want to do much. They just want to stop things. So I think that drives uh, a lot of it. Look, I think the other part of it, and this is just a view coming out of the, the Trump years in January 6th, is that they feel as though democracy is under threat and you need to do anything and everything you can because not doing something about voting laws and all of that is a whole lot worse than the risks of ending up in the minority and having Republicans do anything they want. I, I think the, you know, the problem with this argument is that they're making an argument on principle that the filibuster is antiquated or worse, and we've heard those arguments, what the worst ones are, and yet they've used them freely. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's what cinema says. Year. Just last year. And it's a... it, yeah, and I think it, look, I think it's very hard to win an argument with voters when you practice situational politics, and so much of what goes on in Washington, not all, but so much is situational, that the two sides sort of trade arguments. When you're in the minority, the argument you make is, you should not have a tyranny of the majority. And, of course, the minute you're in the majority, you start complaining about the tyranny of the minority. These are process arguments, and voters look the other way. The, the cinema op-ed says, quote, once in a majority, it is tempting to believe you will stay in the majority, but a Democratic Senate minority used the 60-vote threshold just last year to filibuster a police reform proposal and a COVID relief bill that many Democrats viewed as inadequate. Those filibusters were mounted not as attempts to block progress, but to force continued negotiations towards better solutions. Actually, I think they were mounted to win an election, but that's legitimate in a democracy. Uh, if, if it's to your political advantage, you're going to use it. So the, the, the big deal here is a journalistic deal, David. It is not going to change. So is it not corrupt for journalists to continue to writing as though it's going to end this SB1 isn't going to pass? There isn't going to be voting, but none of this is going to happen. Look, I know what you're getting at. I don't think it's corrupt. I just think it's, you know, not the best journalism. I mean, I think it's important to approach the reporting on this with context and with an understanding of what's going on and where things are headed. But as I, as I have said before, and we, you know, and even I fall prey to this when you feel like you can make news with something 
you press politicians to answer questions that you believe are newsworthy in the moment. But I have never seen this going anywhere. And, and it's, I mean, unless Manchin and Cinema and a couple of other Democrats that don't get a lot of pressure change their mind, nothing is happening. Dead, 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 and they're not going to. David Drucker, thank you, my friend. I'll be right back. America, hour two ahead on The Hugh Hewitt Show. Trending now on The Mike Gallagher Show. Did you see President Biden completely shut down while being asked a question by a member of the media this week about Vladimir Putin? And then his answer was completely incoherent. This is the 46th president of the United States. This is the man who's representing the country to the world. You have to hear this. Cut one. Here was President Biden being asked by a reporter, what do you say about Vlad- Vladimir Putin? What, what, what's, what, and look, you got to hear this. This is unbelievable. What do you say to Vladimir Putin? <laughs> Answer the first question. <laughs> I'm laughing too. They actually, I. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at rumble.com. Trending now on The Dennis Prager Show. There's an article in today's New York Times, Why American Women Everywhere Are Delaying Motherhood. So, for example, would you say that to a young woman? Delay motherhood. Delay getting married. Work on a career. Which... Which do you think is the greater route to to happiness? And for that matter, a question nobody asks. I take that back. Few people ask. What's better for society? Let me ask you a question that I promise you have not heard in any medium. What would be better for America if all of its young women said, you know... I, I was given a good mind and ability. I am going to pursue career. And if, if, a, if a guy comes along, uh, yeah, that's fine. But that's not my priority. Or if all the young women of America said, I'm going to use my abilities to raise wonderful children to be productive citizens. I will work on expanding their mind in literature and in music. I will work on making a happy home. That is where I will use my talents first. Which do you think would make a better America? Not, I'm not asking you which would make a happier woman. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Eric Metaxas Show. Scripturally, mm-hmm. God gives his people authority yeah. that if you are operating in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit, you have authority. But most people think like, well, that's presumptuous. I, right. I don't have any authority. I'm just going <laughs> to hide back here. And I think... That's not biblical, folks. We've yeah, got it. Mean, we're supposed to act. We're, we're called the boldness, not belligerence. You know, I don't have to be a jerk for Jesus, but you know, the world says, oh, you're just arrogant. No, don't mistake arrogance for passion. I'm passionate about standing up and fighting for the Bible, and in this case, the Constitution, because we do have a republic to save. There's no doubt about that. There are a lot of people in, uh, in the evangelical world that they don't understand this. They, all, they almost seem naively to say, like, well, we don't want to fight for America uh, as though that's a dirty thing. In other mm-hmm. words, they, they, they act as though it's about building up the kingdom of America. 